Praise God. It's great to see you out on a Sunday night like this. I mean, we've had an incredible Easter and uh, it was just an amazing time that we had together in God's presence. And um, so, you know, school starts tomorrow for Heights and uh, for any other school in town. The holidays are over and here you are. Um, you're keen to just be in the presence of God in this, uh, in this holiday break and that is uh, so wonderful. You know, we were singing, Awake My Soul and Sing. We were singing, you know, uh, he's a way maker. You know, there's something about the heart that needs to respond to God that moves the heart of God. There's something about us that we have a tendency to sit and hoping that God will move us. But it is that God wants to respond on the basis of what you're doing because you're here in his presence. You shouldn't be waiting for God to move you. You should be wanting to move the heart of God. And that's what our praise and our worship is about. I wanna to talk to you about a subject that a lot of people feel very uncomfortable about. And um, a lot of people um, like to avoid this particular subject. Just in the last um, few weeks, we've been in our devotional, as I hope you've been reading the scriptural verses, not only the comments by the, um, uh, the people who put out the program, but we've been going through the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is a, it's a difficult book for a lot of people to understand. I suggested to my staff that they read it from the Message Bible, a paraphrased translation that's a lot easier. But as you begin to read through the book of the Leviticus, you hear this statement constantly all the time. Be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is something that people think is unattainable. But here, the Lord is talking to in Leviticus, and it's, 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 it's an amazing book. Every time I read Leviticus, I'm conscious, mindful of the holiness of God. I don't know how you perceive uh, 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 what God is like, uh, because I know that God loves us, otherwise he would never have sent his son to sacrifice his life on our behalf. And we'll get to that just in passing. Um, um, but, but I pray that the truth will linger in your heart throughout the week. But this is what the Lord says in a number of places throughout this book. Speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God. I, the Lord your God, am holy. In another place, I think it's um, again in, in chapter 20 of um, Leviticus, in many places, you shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy. When you look at this passage of Scripture, we think holiness is unattainable. When we look at this passage of Scripture and we read about this, we find that God is speaking to a nation that he has redeemed. For 400 years, the family, the early years, it was comfortable going because um, Pharaoh's right-hand man was a man by the name of Joseph. And when Jacob and his family came down to Egypt, he put them in the choicest land in all of Egypt, in the land of Goshen. But it was that as they began to uh, populate and grow, it was that uh, Pharaoh saw them a threat to um, um, himself because these so-called strangers were not indigenous people. They were from another place. They called them Hebrews. And it was that, that they wanted to start stopping them growing, so they planned to have their children, their babies, executed after they were born. And, um, but it so happened that God continued to bless the children of Israel and their population kept growing. So after 400 years, as it was promised, as it was spoken to Abraham, the father of this nation, it was that God said, I would bring you out of this land and bring you into a land that I have chosen. And we look at the history of Israel in its simplicity. God delivered them from bondage and then brought them to Sinai that he might make a covenant with them, that they would enter into a covenant relationship with them so before they could enter into their inheritance. And God in saving us brings us to himself having delivered us from sin's bondage and brings us to himself that he might make a covenant with us 
And in making that covenant, that we could enter into the inheritance that he has for us on our journey. When we consider this wonderful reality, uh, this covenant that God wanted to make with the people of God, uh, the people who he had redeemed, remember he had redeemed them with his precious blood because he says, I'm the one that's redeemed you. I'm the one that's brought you out of Egypt and I am a holy God and now I want you who I've redeemed to be holy. Then he said, I'm gonna tell you how I want you to live. I'm gonna tell you how you should conduct yourself because I'm a holy God. And if you do these things, and that's what Leviticus is about, you will find that in your conduct, you will be holy. And he talks about marital relationships and the intimacy between a man and a woman. He talks about certain foods that you can't eat and all of this sort of thing. And God set the parameters of what he wanted this people to do and entering into a, a covenant relationship with him. But the reason that he wanted them to enter into this covenant relationship with him is that they would be a holy people who would go in and take a hold of the inheritance that he had promised to them. So many people today because of the gospel, and it's a glorious gospel, because it is that in this gospel, it's a message of of, uh, reconciliation. It's a message of peace. It's a message of joy and a message of insurance. Uh, that the security that we have in believing in Jesus, that when it comes time to pass from life to the other side, as Greg spoke this morning, he spoke about his dad, you close your eyes, dad, you'll wake up in heaven because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As we look in this journey, because we're on this journey, it is that God wants us to be a holy people. Turn to somebody and say, God wants us to be a holy people. The people that he's talking to are the people that he's redeemed. It's the people that, who recognize that they've been redeemed. And the only way that you can be redeemed is believe in the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins. But the Bible says and makes it very clear, you haven't been redeemed with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without spot and without blemish. So constantly we see in this passage of Scripture that God wants us to be holy. Today, people talk about, and I hear them talking, not you, but generally speaking, that people talk about the grace of God, but I'm finding that nobody's talking about us being holy. I'm finding that the subject is not really a subject that you hear often on television. And you sometimes wonder that in the New Testament, the people who weren't holy, that's why God sent a Savior. Now, holiness doesn't matter. But if you come to the New Testament, as the apostle is writing to the believers in the New Testament, he says in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, but as you are called, sorry, sorry, but as he who called you is holy, remember he called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It's what you do. And then he says this, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So God is talking about our conduct in this. As I look into the scriptures and I find it a number of places when we talk about holiness, Listen to this for a moment, just in passing, in verse Ephesians chapter one, verse four. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Again, in chapter two, verse uh, 21, it says, um, uh, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple. Do you know what the church is? The church is a holy temple. I don't mean the building. I mean us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I look into the Scriptures in the book of Ephesians, again, the Scripture tells me, and it's so important in verse 22 that it says here, and um, and maybe in verse 21, and you once were alienated and enemies in your mind by your wicked works, that's your conduct, yet now he has reconciled 
and in the body of his flesh through death to present you, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So as I look into the word of God, I find that this work of holiness is something that God wants to see in us. Again, he tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, uh, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. So it is, we find in the Scriptures, it is so important. The church of Jesus Christ is referred to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27, holy brethren. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2, verse 8, that we should lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. The Scripture talks about the Word of God, which we read. It's called, in the Bible, Holy Scriptures. In other words, when the Bible refers to that which is holy, it's referring to that which is sacred or that which is consecrated to God. It is amazing to me that as we look into the Word of God, and the Bible says that you are a holy priesthood. You know, the Scripture says He's made us kings and priests. And the Bible says we are a holy priesthood. When we find in the Scriptures, the Word of God talks about the church being a holy nation. And as I look into the Word of God, when we begin praying in the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Holiness is what the Lord is looking for from his church. It's got to do with our conduct. It's interesting to me because in reading the book of Leviticus, the first five chapters has reference to sacrifices. It has a reference to burnt offerings, meal offerings, peace or fellowship, thanksgiving offerings, sin offerings, and trespass offerings. And there are five references to the sacrifices that people should be regularly making. I mean, Luke uh, made reference for it tonight, if you'd come with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, because the Word of God tells us here in this passage of Scripture that when these sacrifices were made, they were made in reference to the people having um, an awareness of their sins. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10 verse 3, in those sacrifices, the reminder of sins every year. But for it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats that could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, Jesus, talking about Jesus, in burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin, Old Testament, you have no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in a volume of a book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying that sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, did you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. Now you've got to remember that this is what the Lord set in motion for the people when they came out of Egypt. And there was that there was a remedy for sin in type or in shadow for the time because it's not possible. And please understand what I'm about to say. In the Old Testament, it talks about sacrifices. It talks about an atonement for sin. It talks about a covering of our sin. But in the New Testament, it really doesn't use that word. Wherever you get in the letters to the church, the Bible doesn't use that word. It does in one place, but it's a mistranslation. It doesn't use the word atonement. It uses the word reconciliation. That you've been reconciled to God. And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord at Calvary brought about 
to our situation and our lives, a reconcil- not just the covering of our sin, but the removing of our sin, that we could be reconciled to God. And that reconciliation is a reconciliation of friendship, that we've now become friends of God. So in God in rescuing us, when we believed in Jesus, suddenly my conduct, it needs to change. And it's very important. And you know, as I look into the scriptures and I consider these things, what is it that when you come to the table of the Lord that you do? Turn me please to 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is saying that men who eat and drink at the Lord's table, they do that in remembrance of Jesus. And what is it that you remember about Jesus? That his sacrificial death at Calvary? Yes. But in what reference and in what way? Because these five sacrifices of Leviticus have all been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the burnt offering was an offering of consecration. It was an offering of complete and total atonement for our sins. And then there was the meal offering, and that meal offering was given so that you might know that in this sacrifice, we're honoring God, for he shall supply and meet all of our need. And so one is making a sacrifice for the substance of life that we need as we journey through it. And then we come to the peace offering, and this is a, this is a fellowship offering or a thanksgiving offering, and that was given to us in that sense that we could be at peace with God. All this was fulfilled in Jesus. And then we come to the sin offering, and the sin offering has got to do with sins of omission, things that we don't know that we're doing the wrong thing. There are things that I used to do when I was first saved, loving Jesus and walking with him, but some of the things that I do weren't pleasing to him, but I didn't know they weren't pleasing to him because I was just a child growing in the Lord. But as I begin to grow in the Lord, then I begin to realize no longer are there sins of omission. I didn't know that they weren't pleasing to him. So there's sins that are committed unintentionally. And then we come to the trespass offering. The trespass offering is when you transgress knowingly. And people say, well, I don't do that. Well, that's why the Paul, the apostle, or John, the apostle, writes to the church and he says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that's why the Bible says, listen to me, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I get a little concerned for the 21st century church because that 21st century church shows when we come together, we come to celebrate the forgiveness of sins. We come to celebrate that we're walking in a relationship with him. We come to celebrate because of what God has made available for us and what he has done for us. And I'm speaking to my soul to awake and to celebrate what he's done for me. And that's why we come together and do and worship in the way that we do. But keep in mind that I think sometimes my concern is that the church of Jesus Christ, because we do this, we can nearly become pharisaical. We don't recognize the sins that we haven't been, as you heard of Scott talking tonight, totally sold out to God, the consecrated offering. My life is totally yours. In my business, in my family relationship, in my relationship with others, I'm totally sold out to you. And in my relationship and being totally sold out to you, I know that there's provision for me because that's what the meal offering is about. And I'm acknowledging that, that there is provision for me on this journey. And I understand that there is peace offerings and the peace offerings can be fellowship offerings or thanksgiving offerings that we should be thanking God for. And then, and then the sins of omission. Well, I didn't know. But there's a real danger that we can be pharisaical because the reason being is that God has given you a new identity. You're his child. But if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. And if you say you have not sinned, you're calling God a liar. And God says, I have an advocate. His name is Jesus. 
He's going to represent you to me in the heavenly place. And when you come to the table of the Lord, you need to do something. Otherwise, you can eat and drink in an unworthily manner. You need to consider the sacrifice that he made for you. And listen to what the Word of God says in this passage of Scripture. And let a man examine himself. So when we come to the table of the Lord, have I been totally consecrated to you? Have I brought you the holy tithe? Because the tithe is his, it's not yours. You know, we say to people, now you bring your tithes. It's not your tithe. It's his tithe. It belongs to him. Abraham gave him a tithe before the law. If you want to have the tithe under the law, every time you keep it back, you owe 20% interest. So you ought to be thanking God that you're not under the law and still thanking God that the tithe is his. Because if you want to work under the law, you've got to pay 20% interest. So I'm not under law, I'm under grace. So when you come, do you examine yourself? Are you, have you been thankful? I mean, oh, I've come short of giving thanks. One of the things that I learned in my journey of life, I'm constantly thankful, constantly looking for every good reason the start of every day. And in every day, being thankful. And I notice in the scriptures that, you know, there may be sins of omission. I didn't realize that, that you know, that I'm not perfect. I mean, you, you know, God have mercy. Which one of us are perfect? You know, God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for obedient people and people who will identify with him. And there's provision for you for cleansing. And here, as we had communion tonight, and then we come to the trespass offering. And the trespass offering has got to do with restitution. The wrong that you've done, you owe somebody something. And in one sacrifice for sin forever, Jesus has done this for us. Somebody, we should be breaking out in acclamation. He's done that all for us. And so when I come to the table of the Lord, the scripture says, over the years I've heard people talk like, I'm unworthy to eat. The Bible says you should examine yourself and then eat. It doesn't say don't eat, it says eat because there's provision at Calvary for you because Jesus' sacrifice was the complete and total sacrifice for all of us. The challenge is that, of course, we can find ourselves in trouble because we just want to ignore the fact that we may have come short even though we are the redeemed people. And we celebrate that he's made up all the difference and we come afresh with our lives and we say, we are yours because you have redeemed us. When the Bible talks about our conduct, it is extremely important. You know, of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Bible tells us, let me just get some scribbling notes that I've written down here. Uh, But the Bible tells us very clearly that um, the Lord Jesus, as we see in the Scriptures, in Hebrews 10, in the Lord Jesus presented his whole body as a living sacrifice. The Lord Jesus, when he was asked the question, he said, I have not come to destroy the law, I've come to fulfill it. And the Lord Jesus is the perfect man who fully kept the law of God, then offered himself for you and for me as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Do you know that Jesus is holy and acceptable to God? Everybody say that with me. Jesus is holy and acceptable to God. I said to the Lord the other day in my prayer time and talking to him, all that came before you are not, in no way could be equal to you. And all that have come after you in no way could be equal to you. For you were without sin. You fully kept the law. If you understand a little theology in in Matthew 17, when Jesus stood before the judgment bar of God, and there Moses and Elijah appeared, one representing the law, Moses, the other, the prophet, was the prophets, that Jesus had fully kept the law. You know, when we look at the law in the Old Testament, 
There's the ritualistic law of animal sacrifices, and then there's the moral conduct of the law. And sometimes we separate them. But God puts them all into one package. And if you break one of them, you break all of them. It's like a, it's like a, a necklace of beads that, you know, suddenly if you, if you break the beads, suddenly all, they're all broken and you've lost, you've broken them all. And so Jesus comes, keeps the law perfectly, then offers himself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God on behalf of every single one of us. And all he wants you to do is to believe in him, to receive him, and to follow him. So here God brings the children of Israel out of bondage, out of Egypt. And he said, now I want you to live this particular way. And this is what I want you to do. And I want you to do this and this because I don't want you to live like the people who lived this way in the land of Egypt. I want you to live differently. And I want you to also understand that the country that you're going into, the people used to live like the Egyptians, but I want you to live differently to them because I'm holy. And I want you to be holy. And I want you to be holy in all your conduct. So when I read the book of Leviticus, I'm just, it's illuminated to my heart how holy God is. I know he's gracious. I know he's merciful. I mean, I know he's holy, but as we were reading it, it just was magnified to my life. And I started to sing the old hymn, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. When we look into the scriptures and we see the holiness of God and it's, it's how much that he does so genuinely love us. And so as I was reading through um, these wonderful Psalms and, and uh, just so blessed this week, let me just highlight a few little verses to you that really stood out to me. Firstly, in Psalm uh, 25, for as I was going through these uh, wonderful Psalms, um, um, and, and I love these Psalms, they were just, the Lord just quickened my heart. And you know, he, to my heart, His truth. Let me say something to you, and I don't want to take too long on this. You see this book. The Bible says, this is a living word. This is a living book. It's not just page, it's a living book. Every word of God in this book. Now listen, not everything in this book is a word of God. There's records of what men does. It's a record that God kept and led us to know about men's failures and what he did to help them. And men's failures, when they didn't repent, what happened to them. But that's, a, that's a, a correct record. But when God is speaking in this book, it's a living word to your heart and to your life. And as you read it, then out of that living word comes a rhema word to you, a personal word that God is actually talking to you through this book. It's a living word, but he makes it a personal word or a rhema word to your heart. So you need to read, if you want to hear the voice of God, you need to read the living word, and he'll quicken certain verses and passages are you, as you're reading it, and you'll feel and recognize how personal God is to you. And so, as I was reading this passage of Scripture in Psalm 25, who is the man who fears the Lord? You know, I told you the other Sunday, uh, the fear of the Lord is honoring the Lord with a passion. The fear of the Lord is honoring the Lord with a passion. A lot of people say they honor the Lord, but you need to honor the Lord with a passion. Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. Himself shall dwell in prosperity. Listen, his descendants shall, be, shall inherit the earth. 
then the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. What is that secret? And he will show them his covenant. And God bringing the children of Israel out of bondage brings them into a covenant relationship that they might be entered into the inheritance that he has for them. And he'll show them the secrets of the covenant of how they can enter into the inheritance. The scripture goes on to say in this passage of scripture, and it's so very important. He says here, my eyes are ever toward the Lord and he shall pluck my feet out of the net. You know, as you're walking around at times, you need to be watching your steps and where you're walking. But the scripture says that in a spiritual sense, we need to be looking to the Lord, not worrying about our feet. Because he'll look after our feet as we're looking to him and him directing us. I'm talking in a spiritual sense, not in a, if you're walking around and you're jogging or whatever, yeah, dodge the potholes, watch out where you're stepping. But, but normally that's what we do in life. But our eyes need to be upon him. And then in Psalm 32, I read that to you out of my Bible because it says, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And as I was, as I was reading uh, this wonderful passage, I decided to read it from the NLT translation. And it says, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. The trespass offering. Whose sin is put out of sight. The burnt offering. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. The sin offering. Or oh, the joy. So when we come to the table of the Lord, did you ever examine yourself? What did you say? I'm all right. I believe in Jesus. I know you are. You are all right. He's given you a new identity. But please, please, please don't become like the Pharisees. Because they never looked. They thought, you know, they had the entitlement attitude. This is our land. God gave us this land. But their conduct wasn't right. And until 1948, after what happened in AD 70, they've been scattered all around the world. And now God in his purpose and his time is bringing them back because there's gonna come a change. The church is at the centerfold in the centerpiece of God's attention. But once the rapture takes place, then his attention will turn to Israel. And wonderful things are gonna happen and also some unbelievable challenging things. And so I begin to read this and begin to rejoice in this as I consider these wonderful words and in Psalm 32, he said, you're my hiding place. In Christ is my hiding place. In Christ, I'm accepted in the beloved. Everybody say it. In Jesus, I'm accepted. You're not accepted because who you are. You're accepted in Jesus because you put your faith in him. And he said, you're my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Or you shall surround me with songs of victory. Somebody say amen. Listen to what he says. I'll instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule or has no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle, else you, they will uh, not come near you. In other words, you've got to put a, a bit in the horse's mouth. They tell me the horses, I don't know anything about horses, but they tell me the, bit, the, the, the bit's put in and the, the, the part where the bit is, the horse's, the horse's mouth is tender. And so that's why you can steer it with the reins. Get him to go left and get him to go right. Now, mind you, I've never ridden a horse because you know, it wouldn't help me, but that's what they say. But God doesn't want you to be like that. I want to guide you with my eye. I don't want to jerk you around. He said, don't be like that. Listen to what I'm saying. And the, the scripture says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy. All you upright in heart. Turn to Psalm 50 with me. As I was starting to read Psalm 50, I mean, this psalm has always touched my heart many years ago. But as the Lord speaks in this particular psalm out of Psalm 50, he begins to um, uh, talk about the people who are ritual in their activities. You know, God gave the children of Israel 
a lot of rituals to perform, such as the sacrifices, such as the keeping of the, the Passover, such as the keeping of the Feast of Pentecost, such as the keeping of the Feast of Tabernacles, etc. in the Day of Atonement. And they had to celebrate and keep all these. And people love these festivals. People love the celebration of these festivals. And if you read in John chapter 8, people were celebrating their festival, and it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the last day of the feast, Jesus arrives, and he stands up, and the Bible says he shouted with a loud voice, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Jesus was shouting because they were celebrating the festival and did not have any idea what it represented or what it meant. And Psalm 50 is the very thing that he speaks about. You've got into rituals. Why are you doing what you're doing? What do they mean? But people go through the motions. And we have very few rituals in our church. The only one we really have is communion and water baptism. But we have communion regularly because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, why his sacrifice was all complete. And you might come and think, I haven't been wholly consecrated to you. Oh, Jesus, I haven't been considering that you will care for me and provide for me in the meal offering. I hear I've been laboring. You see, the Bible says this, that there is a rest for the people of God as they're believing in God for what God has done. So your days of work are over. I don't mean that you shouldn't get up and go to work. I mean the provision that God has for you, you can't earn. He just wants to give it to you. So it's in this relationship that we have with him. And it's in this relationship as we come to the table of the Lord and remember it. So he's talking about these people who are into rituals. And he says, uh, um, um, he says, look at it in verse um, uh, maybe, um, he says, uh, uh, verse seven, oh, my people, I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I'm God, you're God. He said, my people, I'm gonna testify against you. I'm God, I'm your God. I'll not rebuke you for your sacrifices, nor for your burnt offerings, which you continually before me. And I'll take, not take a bull from your house, nor goats from your holes, or even beasts from the forests of the, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on the thousand hills are mine, and I know all the birds in the mountains, and the wild beasts are, uh, 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 of the field are mine. And if I were hungry, I, well, I would not tell you. And if the world is mine in all its fullness, do you know that I remember one time I was ministering in, uh, in uh, Malaysia, and I went up to Penang, and the church service in this building outside, here were people, they brought um, offerings to their gods, brought food, and they sat it on their shrines to their gods, and they put it there so that the gods could firstly eat the food. Mind you, who knows that they didn't eat the food? Who believes that people do that in the 20th, 20th century? And, the 20th, and all the flies were coming around. And I'm watching this. And then I walk into the house of the Lord and begin to preach the gospel to the people that were inside. And here the Lord says to us clearly, if I were hungry, would not I tell you the world is mine? Will I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And then he goes on to say in this passage of scripture, hang on, you've got to watch this. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or to take my covenant in your mouth? Because it's very important what you confess. See, you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. You saw a thief, you con uh, consented with him, you agreed with him. You've been a partaker with adulterers. You've given your mouth to evil and your tongue frames the seat. You sit and speak against your brother and slander your own mother's son and things, things you have done and I kept silent and you thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. He says this, watch this. Because these people are into ritual. Now consider this, 
You who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces. And there's none to deliver. In other words, God doesn't want to just be into rituals. We come together for a reason. And we come together celebrating the provision of Calvary and all that he has done for us. And we examine ourselves to see whether I've been trusting, whether I've been confessing, whether I've been doing the wrong thing. And there is a cleansing for us. Because the scripture says you're, you are accepted in the beloved. But only because of Calvary. Only because of Jesus. We sang that song, Worthy is your name. And then he says this, this is one of my favorite verses in the Psalms. Who offers praise? Whoever offers praise? Whoever offers praise glorifies me. Watch this. And to him who orders his conduct aright. God is interested in my conduct. The Bible talks about immoral, immoral impure sexual conduct in Leviticus. God is not against sex. He created it. And it's not just for procreation. It's for enjoyment between a husband and a wife. And God lays clear boundary guidelines, and we can see this, and the Bible makes it very clear that you all need to order your conduct aright and what you're saying and what you're doing. And then he says, I will show the salvation of God. Notice, we give him praise for our deliverance. We give him praise for our salvation. We give him praise for our redemption. And we're ordering our conduct aright. And then he says, I will show the salvation of God. That's the covenant. That's the covenant. How do you know that, Pastor? Do you realize that all that came out of Egypt and came to Sinai, the greatest majority of them that came out never entered into the inheritance? Because they didn't change their conduct. They didn't change their conduct. And 20 and older died in the wilderness. And there was a new generation that rose up. And so it's got to do with conduct. And conduct to me is the revelation of the covenant. And you're walking in this covenant relationship with God and God wants to take you into the inheritance in this life and eternity. I wanna say something to you that when you do, and you do frequently in this church, and it's so important, whenever you come into the house, whoso offers praise glorifies me. You know, in Psalm 103, as we were singing that song, Waymaker, and I was thinking about it, you know, um, and other songs, awake my soul and sing. Soul, wake up. Me, wake up. Come on, give him praise. But when you come to an altar, I see so many times people coming and just standing. So often I see it all the time. And I just wish they'd start thanking God that they can come to him. I wish they'd start thanking God that they're coming to the mercy seat, to coming to the throne where they'll find grace to help in their time of need. So often we come to an altar and we're still mute and we still want God to do something when we need God, but we don't do much. Or we'll shout at a football match or if there's a competition on that somebody's won, we'll be happy and we'll be shouting, we'll talk about it. But when we come into the house of the Lord, there is not the measure of praise and the shout of praise and God whoever, who so offers praise glorifies. Thank you, Father, for the provision that your son has given to us. Thank you, Lord. He's our complete sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, as you examine your heart, thank you, Lord, that you make up all the difference of my failures because I'm accepted in the beloved. And I want you to present me faultless 
with exceeding joy. Come with me, please, in this passage of Scripture in the book of Jude. For in the book of Jude, the Word of God tells us this. And you're going to tell me, no, you won't, you won't be game. But people could come to me and say, oh, that's not possible, isn't it? The Bible says, now unto him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy as you change your conduct. What happens is he makes up all the shortfall and he sees as you're learning and as you examine yourself, you're not belittling yourself, you're thanking him for the provision. When you come to the altar and you have a need of healing, when you come to the altar, you're coming under the shadow of the cross when you're coming to receive the provision because Jesus is all the complete and you're thanking him and you're thanking him. So whoso offers praise glorifies me and to him who changes his conduct, I will show the covenant to him. So many people are only happy in redemption, but there's a covenant relationship that God wants you to walk with him in. He's made a new covenant. The shedding of his precious blood is about the new covenant. It's not just about redemption. Now, the most wonderful thing about this Christian walk is it all happens at one time because the, the Bible says you are saved and you are sanctified. But do you recognize that the work of sanctification has got to do with your conduct? How do you talk to your boss? How do you talk to your spouse? How do you talk to your children? How do you talk to your employees? What is your conduct? What do you watch on television? What is your conduct? Our God is a holy God. A lot of people wanna be happy in this life and when they get to heaven, then they think they can be holy. But God wants you to be holy here so that you'll be happy there. Would you stand in his presence with me? In the name of Jesus. He says in Leviticus. And I want to read it to you. I could quote it, but. No, I want to read it to you. In Leviticus 19, in many places, listen. He says, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It says in Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, and it's so important that you recognize this. Oh, please consider your conduct. And he says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You know, when he saved me, I didn't realize he made me holy. When he saved me, I didn't realize he made me holy. And as I began to grow in grace, I began to realize that God made me holy. And I began to declare, before I even endeavored to change my conduct, that I'm a holy person. the Bible says we're a holy priesthood and we're a holy nation. And I began to declare, and what I found that as I began to declare, because I was in a covenant relationship with Him, I released the power to make the right choices. And for my conduct, I ordered a right. God has saved you. God loves you. God is not interested in rituals. God is interested in what's coming from your heart and what begins to stir. And as I begin to sing and to praise Him, I begin to thank Him. 
And there may be things that I see as I'm singing and praising that, oh, this needs to be corrected. Oh, I need to consider that. Change my ways here. But I'm giving Him thanks because the provision for all of this is made for you and for me if we'll dare to believe. He wasn't satisfied with the burnt offerings and the meal offerings and the peace offerings and the sin offerings. And yet He instituted it. It was only for a time of atonement or a time for covering. But it's only through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that He wants you to be reconciled to Him and be His friend. And having redeemed you, He wants you to be a holy people. Hallelujah. We need to, whenever we come to the house of the Lord, we need to come with our best voice. And you know you're in your best voice if you're cheering at a football match and you worship God with that best voice in the house. Or you're in a contest somewhere and you're so happy and you want to talk about it. And you know you're in your best voice when you're in the house of the Lord because, because your soul, you're awakening your soul to know the reality of this amazing grace that God wants to manifest in your life because He's brought you into a covenant relationship with Him and He wants you to walk with Him in this. People are tired of people who have ritual and hypocrites. But when they see people in a covenant relationship with God and they're walking with Him. They start to say, I think I can do that. If He can do it, why can't I? How did you do it? How did you come by this? Holy. I am holy, said the Lord, your God. I'm a holy God. I've read it all the time through. And as I was reading it, I sang, oh, my Lord, thank you for giving me a glimpse again of your holiness. Thank you that I'm seeing afresh the wonder of who you are, that you should have your son who kept the law perfectly and then offered himself as a living sacrifice on behalf of all who will believe in him, that we can be accepted in the beloved. And coming to him and being accepted, we can start, our conduct will change. Whoso offereth praise, glorifies me and to him who orders his conduct aright I will show the salvation of God he doesn't mean to be born again it means walking in a covenant relationship with him where full provision is yours hallelujah